Can people hear me? Sounds good. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we've got a talk to you for you first thing this morning here. Hopefully, everybody's awake, has gone through those keynotes, and is ready to get into some technical content. Um, we'll have two people speaking, myself uh, and Thomas Sharan. So Thomas Sharan is uh, one of the founders of the Drill Project, a PMC member, and he's also the VP of Product at MapBar. Uh, myself, Jacques Nadeau, uh, I am the J Drill PMC chair, which is called VP of Apache Drill, um, and I've been working on it for about three years. So we really wanted to talk to you about sort of a quick overview of what Drill is, and then we'll get into some details of like how it works some, and, and some example demos. All right, so at a high level, it's an open source SQL query engine, okay? And it's designed for non-relational data stores, which is kind of how it's a little bit different than most other systems today. Um, it has a sort of built-in JSON document model, and it's columnar throughout, both on disk and in memory, okay? And so the key advantages of this is, one, you can query all your non-relational data stores, do analytical things that you'd like to normally do with all your systems, right? Uh, one of the visions behind it, the foundation principles, is sort of low to no overhead, and that means avoid maintaining schema, avoid transforming data, ETL should be a thing of the past, okay? And that means we really wanna be able to treat my data like a table even if it isn't a table in the traditional sense. You can use the BI tools that you already have, and you can start on a laptop if you just wanna experiment, but you can scale up to thousands of nodes. And really, at the end of the day, it's all about great performance, scalability, and also quick iteration. And so I'm gonna start with a quote here. This is a quote from uh, Andrew Brust at ZDNet. Um, and there's a lot of words here, so, but let me read out sort of the last two sentences, which I think are key, which is, is that, so while, while Drill uses SQL and can connect to Hadoop, calling it SQL on Hadoop kind of misses the point. A better name might be SQL on everything with very low setup requirements. Because the reality is, is that I'd love to just, if I could do a quick sampling here, how many people hold their data in only one type of system? Like I only hold it in HBase, or I only hold it in files in Hadoop, or I only hold it in MongoDB. Like, versus, so, so raise your hands if you only hold your data in one system. Okay, I, I think I see one hand over there, I think that's about it. Raise your hand if you hold your data in many systems that are of different data models. Okay, that's, I think that's most everybody, right? And so the reality is, is that SQL is a very valuable tool to get at data, but most people have data in lots of different data sources. And that's really the vision behind Drill. And so the goal being, any non-relational data store should be available, you should be able to access it using your standard SQL interfaces. That means file systems, so whether it's my local file system, my data's on a NAS, or it could be a Hadoop file system. We're at Hadoop Summit here, so of course it could work with HDFS, it also works with the MapR file system, okay? But it can also work in the cloud. If you've got a cloud storage service like uh, the Amazon Cloud S3, the Azure blob storage, those kinds of things, you also should be able to access your data with SQL in those types of systems. Of course, huge amounts of NoSQL databases out here. We've got like four or five listed here, but the reality is, is that there's lots and lots of these things. And so Drill already supports a bunch of them out of the box, but what we're doing is working with all those communities to continue to add additional support for new types of systems. So that's important, so you need to be able to access your data wherever your data is. But the second thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to use the clients that you're used to using, right? So that starts with the simple ones, the people, ones people know, like ODBC and JDBC, but it also includes things like, yeah, I wanna be able to access my data using REST. I might wanna do some kind of JavaScript thing using D3, right? I wanna be able to access it with a C program or a Java program. And you might be like, well, what about, why is there C and Java and ODBC and JDBC? And the reality is, is because Drill exposes so much power that it extends well beyond what traditional ODBC and JDBC capabilities allow. So Drill actually has these lower level interfaces as well. And so at the core of Drill, we wanted to achieve what we describe as complete or end-to-end -end performance, okay? And it starts with what everybody talks about, right? I need to be able to read data off of disk fast, I need to be able to you know, do my operations in memory fast, I need to avoid spooling to disk unless I absolutely ne need to, right? I need to be able to scale out, I can't just do a scale up model. Right, so that's all very important, and Drill does that extraordinarily well. In fact, there'll be benchmarks coming out very shortly that show how fast Drill can do these things. Now, I'll warn you with any benchmark, right, is the best way to understand a system is to try it on your use case, because benchmarks are known to be a little bit misleading. But Drill is extraordinarily fast, faster than all the Java engines that exist today, and faster than most of the C engines that are out there, or at least competitive with them, okay? Now, on top of that, though, you gotta do the execute fast, that's sort of table stakes in the game, but you also need to be able to iterate fast, and this is where I think most of the other systems that are out there today have sort of missed, dropped the ball. And the reality is, is that you wanna be able to work without prep, you wanna decentralize your data management, everybody's working with data in your organization, you don't wanna have to go through a central data engineering organization. You need to be able to do in-situ security, you shouldn't have a secondary security model which is independent of the data, because that causes lots of problems, because you get conflicts and sort of mismatches, right? And you also need to be able to do this thing which I describe as sort of explore and query. There are tools out there that allow you to explore your data, there are tools out there that allow you to query your data. 
But the reality is, is that you might explore and sort of transform your data, understand it better, logical transformations typically, and then you're gonna start querying it, and then you're gonna realize that you need to explore it some more. And this sort of pattern goes back and forth, and so if you have to use two different systems to do those two different things, it slows you down substantially, right? Access the multiple sources like I spoke about before, and then lastly, sort of avoid this sort of ETL rinse cycle, if you will. And the way that we do this is we basically looked at the data in the world and we said, hey, the problem with existing systems is they don't match the model of data that most people are using today, okay? They kind of sit in this lower left quadrant, okay? Which is kind of tables and columns, sort of a spreadsheet interface. And while that's very helpful and simple, right, the reality is more and more people's data doesn't fit into that category. And so if you see those three other quadrants, right, it's very hard to figure out how do I map the data in those quadrants back into this rows and columns model. Right? And so what we did from the beginning is we said, hey, Drill needs to work with the most complicated data model, which is really JSON. And as much as everybody talks about JSON, you really have to think about it because it's kind of a pain because every single record can have a different schema associated with it. You've got complex structures inside of it. And if you take that as your sort of fundamental principal model for how you build the system, then everything else is simply a reduction of that. And that's really how Drill got built. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to act like a database Right? So you get all your standard NC SQL, you get all your data types, you get your subqueries, your CTEs, your partition pruning, all that stuff. And that allows you to do your sort of more traditional sort of SQL and Hadoop things like data warehouse offload. You can use your existing BI tools like Tableau. You can do TPCH and TPCDS like workloads, right? And we also support all the standard Hive components that you're used to because we think that that's very important and part of the sort of ecosystem here. Right? But you also need to be able to use it like a database even if your data doesn't look like that. Right? And that means that if your data is just sitting in a file system, you should be able to query that directly without any extra setup. You need to be able to have the modern data types like map and array and actually any type, which is a very powerful new concept that Drill provides. You need to be able to have a bunch of additional tools to work with this data because the reality is, is that complex or multi-schema data is very hard to manage if you only have your traditional SQL tools because there aren't concepts that need to be implemented, right? And so Drill has those things. So Flatten is, in, is, is a very powerful relational operator that Tomer will get to in a little bit. Uh, as well as convert from, convert to, and those kinds of things. And this allows you to open up to a whole new set of use cases, whether that be JSON sensor analytics, complex data analysis of one sort or another, or even being able to write alternative do domain-specific languages for your particular use case. And why did we do this? Well, at the core is, is we wanted to support the changing data organization. If you look at the data organization 15 years ago, it really looked like this thing on the left-hand side, right? You go through all of these different steps, and, and it's really a DBA-driven organization, right? The DBA defines what the data models are, but they, they talk to the developer for requirements, but then they kind of, all the, the tables, the indices, the foreign key relationships, they figure out how to do that, then they say, hey, this is what the scheme is, then the developer has to store into that data, right? And then basically the BI guy builds the reports, analysts views the reports, and then we go from there. The reality is today is, is that most of that model ex does no longer exists, right? In many cases, the developer decides 90% before anybody else even knows what's going on with the application, right? So things like the rise of Mongo, right? Mongo's key capability was the allowance of a, a developer to sort of model things the way that they thought about them, an object-oriented model using a complex data model on, on disk, right? And just works directly with that between that and the application. Right? They started building these applications before the rest of the organization could even do like a vendor selection process. Right? Very powerful, very fast, time to market is great, right? but it sort of left everybody in the cold. And so what we see happening is, is that the analysts then need to be able to query that data directly. And that's really where Drill comes into place. And so of course, after the fact, you can sort of do things like performance uh, optimizations. So how does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. Everything starts with this concept of the drill bit. The drill bit is a daemon, it's a process, right? And what it allows you to do is sort of do query execution. It has this really powerful capability to do what is described as in-memory columnar execution. It's the first engine that fully subscribes to this new model of execution. Other tools have started to toy with it, but we're the first to say, hey, the whole system needs to work columnar in memory, okay? It directly inter interacts with the data, and what it does is it says, hey, I'm gonna start reading the data, I'm gonna look at the query, the query implies some kind of knowledge that the user might have about the data, and then they're gonna compare that as they start to read the data. And I'm gonna read the data and say, oh, this is what the data actually looks like, so how does that map to what the user's saying? Right? But that happens all on the fly without any setup ahead of time. Right? It's built to use huge amounts of memory. So we frequently do uh, uh, testing work on drill uh, on large clusters using 200 gigs of memory per node. Right? And that's because in many cases, if you want to work with really large data sets you, and you want that high speed, latent, that, that low latency, sort of high, highly interactive 
experience, you need that kind of memory to work with. Now, of course, you can work with smaller amounts of memory. It also spools the disk and all of those things. So you can work in a smaller memory footprint, but if you want that fastest speed, you'll typically want to use large amounts of memory. Now, this is where drill is really interesting. Is this is actually going to be networked or not. Okay? And we did this because we know that a developer or an analyst who wants to start working with a tool doesn't want to have to spin up a giant cluster to sort of experiment. And so you can download Drill, and that's what the demo will be in a minute, onto your laptop. You can start using it there. You can start to understand what schema-free analytics really looks like. And then from there, you can say, okay, once I'm starting to find this useful, I can always choose to scale it up to a larger cluster. Exposes all the interfaces like we talked about, and it also has a built-in web UI. So you can see what sort of complex or telemetry about your query and those kinds of things. And it's very, very extensible because we realize, as an open source project, the most important thing is extensibility because people need to take it and use it for their own purposes. Right? And so you take these drill bits and you can put them on different nodes. And so what most people have is what I describe as more of a data maelstrom. The, the idea that it's a data lake, that it's all calm and peaceful and everything works together well, is kind of unrealistic. Right? You've got all these different systems. They have all their own requirements. And so how does drill kind of fit into this? Well, the idea is, is that you can put a drill bit on any of these nodes. Right? And if you put the drill bits on each of the nodes and co-locate them with the individual data, that allows you to avoid having to pull everything across the network. And that gives you that sort of high-speed parallel performance. And so how does it happen, sort of the execution inside the model? Well, you've got a user, right? He connects through some kind of system to a particular drill bit. And you can connect to any drill bit. There's no special drill bit. There is no master or sort of slave kind of, it's just everybody's peer-to-peer -peer here, okay? So a user connects up to one drill bit and submits a query. Okay, that drill bit now becomes a foreman for that query. Now this is an ephemeral role just for the purpose of this query. And so this foreman is responsible for generating the execution plan, right, and as part of that it does the standard cost-based query optimization. Now it does the standard and the non-standard because remember, we don't necessarily know schema when we do this. So we have to do some special things in the optimization to at least make the best decisions we can, right? And from there it also looks at the data locality, seeing where the data is located in that large cluster of nodes and saying, okay, let's make sure that we try to position execution as close as possible to those nodes. So once that plan gets put in place, then that drill bit talks to all of its peers and says, hey, let's do this, this query, sends out the execution information to all those nodes to do the work. And as part of a query, if you look at a complex query, you may have multiple phases to the query where you're redistributing the data over and over again if it's a you know, five or seven way join with lots of group bias and aggregations, right? And so the drill bits will then talk to each other and work through that process, moving the data around as optimistically as possible, and then the results will then be returned to the user if it's a uh, sort of a select star or something like that. Okay, so from there I'm gonna hand it off to Tomer, who was right here, oh there he is. Um, and Tomer can talk to you about sort of a, a sort of concrete demo of how to analyze Yelp data. Okay. Thanks, Jock. So we're gonna walk through uh, actually a demo using a data set, uh, or a couple of different data sets. One of them uh, made available by Yelp uh, that has actual, actual real world uh, business data and user reviews and things like that. And then we'll look at another data set as well. Um, so I wanna show you first of all how you'd get started with Drill. So it all starts with downloading and installing it and we've made it super simple so that you can download and install it on your laptop. And, uh, and I think that's how most people get started. They just you know, take your Mac, your Windows laptop, download and install it, right? So it's a tarball, you download it, um, you untar it, and then you run the command drill embedded. Drill embedded just means that you're running drill um, without having to run a separate daemon, and then you get a command prompt and you can type your SQL queries. So in this case, I have on my laptop in under slash users slash my username slash Yelp slash user.json. That's just a JSON file, so I'm gonna do a select star here, limit one, and I get the first record in this uh, user.json file, okay? I don't have to run Zookeeper and I can actually, actually access the web uh, UI at port 8047. In the web UI, you'll see all the details. There's various uh, visualizations of the query execution, uh, the query plan, uh, how it ran. You can kind of uh, look, at, look at the performance there. Um, if you wanna run it in distributed mode, it's not actually not a lot harder. All you have to do is set up, uh, uh, make sure you have Zookeeper running. So you, you know, if you already have a Zookeeper cluster, you don't have to worry about that. You start the drill bit on every node by running drill bit.sh start, and then you, uh, if you want to use uh, the, the interactive shell, you just run drill conf. Drill conf is conf is for configuration. There's a config file that says, where is this zookeeper? So by default, it's, it's local host. And so we run, in this case, we're running a query that does a select, uh, select the stars and how many people gave that uh, rating to, to a business uh, from the review.json data set. So this is a data set of uh, reviews. And so I was wondering, you know, do more people give uh, Yelp uh, reviews with uh, one star or five stars? Because I know I'm, you know, I'm, you know, being a bad person like I am. I usually only do reviews when I'm really, really upset, right? But uh, it turns out most people aren't that bad, and 
there's actually way more five-star reviews than, uh, than there are one-star reviews, which was uh, kind of a surprise to me. Okay, so uh, uh, next thing you wanna do is you wanna configure the data store. So um, this is, what, what are you actually gonna be querying? Are you gonna be querying uh, data from MongoDB, from HDFS, from MapRFS, from uh, MapRDB, from HBase, et cetera, right? So you enter the drill user interface. You can also, also do this from the REST API. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're gonna start by enabling the MongoDB storage plugin, which uh, isn't enabled by default. So you click the enable button and you provide the connection string to, to that Mongo uh, cluster. And um, we're also gonna find a workspace in the distributed file system. So a workspace is just a shortcut to a specific directory so that we don't have to type the full path of the files that we're going to be analyzing. So instead of you know, slash starting at root, it's gonna start at some directory. And so I put all the files for this demo in this uh, demo data directory that you see, uh, uh, you see here circled on the right. Okay, let's, let's start exploring this data and ask some interesting questions and see what, uh, what we can learn from this data set using, uh, using drill. Uh, Actually, before we do that, I wanna show you what, the, what these files look like so it's gonna make more sense later when we query them. So there's actually two files. One is names.csv. This is a file I downloaded from the internet. It's a small file, has all the, uh, the names of people in the, uh, in the US. And uh, it also says, based on probability, is this uh, more likely a male or a female? And then some of them are unknown because you know, if it's like 40, 60, I, don't think, I think they just keep it as unknown. Um, this is an example of like the review.json uh, file. This is a single record in there, what you see here at the bottom in the black. Um, so the votes is, a, is a, actually a map. Uh, the user ID is a string and you can see there's different types of uh, structures here. Um, and then we can look at an example of one of the MongoDB collections that are here and this one is called users. Uh, basically what we've done is we've actually put the, the Yelp users uh, data set and just loaded into Mongo with, with the import command. Um, so this is the query we did earlier. We can do it on a file. We can also do this on, uh, on a Mongo collection. We saw um, that most people give five-star reviews to, to businesses. One of the nice things that Drill uh, supports in order to make it easy to query data is it provides this kind of uh, global namespace of, uh, of data. So when in order to refer to a file or a table, all you have to do is specify the path uh, to that resource as, as the table name in the SQL query. So for example, if you're querying from a, a file, uh, let's say a JSON file or a Parquet file, you could just specify um, the, the name of the, the path to that JSON file or the Parquet file, and you can use this notation of, you know, first of all, the storage plugin name, this is the, in this case, DFS, and then root is the workspace name. So the root is a built-in one that just is the root of that file system. Um, you can see the next example here is dfs.demo. So in this case, demo is the workspace name, and that just makes it easier to type these, uh, these file names. And if you're querying from a Mongo table, for example, then you'd specify the storage plugin name. In this case, we defined as Mongo, and you can actually have multiple of these for different, if you have multiple Mongo clusters. Uh, then it's the Mongo database name and the Mongo collection name. And this makes it really easy, especially when you start thinking about, okay, I want to do a join between my Mongo collection and my log files in Hadoop. I can actually go do a join on those things and it's as simple as specifying the path to those two resources as part of that join query. So let's look at another example here. What are the most common usernames? And this time we're gonna do the query on, uh, on a Mongo collection. So we're gonna do a select name and then count star as users from the users table in Mongo or the collection in Mongo. We're gonna group by name and then order it by the most common names. And we can see that you know, as, as expected, David is, you know, and John and, and Michael and Chris are some of the more popular names in that, uh, in that data set. So no surprise there. What are the cities with the most businesses? So this is a, happens to be a data set, uh, I think for the kind of Arizona, Nevada area. And so the city with the most businesses, not surprising, uh, you know, when we do this uh, group by on business.json is, uh, is Las Vegas followed by Phoenix and then uh, Scottsdale. Okay, let's look now at how we would explore complex data. And what I mean by complex data is things uh, that have nested values, that have arrays in them. And this is increasingly common uh, as you know, more and more applications and online APIs and, uh, and logging systems are, are actually adopting JSON as their, their uh, standard format. Uh, but other formats like Parquet, for example, uh, also support you know, complex data and are typically used in that way. So we'll, we'll focus on this one data set or this one file called business.json. And what I'm showing you here is actually just a single record or a single, you know, sometimes people call it a document uh, in that file. And so this represents a single business um, um, on the strip in Las Vegas and you can see different fields. So for example, business ID is a string, but then you get into this field called hours and it's actually a map of maps. So hours has 
you know, Monday as a key, and then there's a close and an open field in there. And, uh, and if you look at categories, that's actually an array. So it's essentially like a bunch of tags that, uh, uh, what categories does this business belong to? So this is a steakhouse, it's a French steakhouse, it's a restaurant, and also serves, I guess, uh, breakfast and brunch. Um, here's another interesting uh, field that's part of this same document. This is Again, part of that same uh, single record. So you have this attributes field. And again, uh, it can be arbitrary attributes in the file. Um, that's not something we could define an upfront in a schema because more people, more Yelp users can actually add additional attributes. And so this is very dynamic and some of them are Boolean, some of them are strings. So it's a very complicated uh, type of uh, uh, record. So let's look at an example here. And we're asking here, which places are open right now? So you know, I'm trying to find a place to go eat or uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's 10 p.m., okay? And so I'll run a query and I'll select name and uh, hours from this, this data set. And I'm using this dot notation on, to access these nested values. So b.hours.saturday.open is less than uh, 22, um, which is 10 p.m., uh, for those not familiar. Uh, and saturday.close is greater than 10. And, uh, and then I find out that, uh, you know, the first uh, two restaurants that come up are these, uh, this Chinese, uh, actually probably two uh, Chinese restaurants that happen to be open and, you know, both of them close after 10 p.m. on a Saturday. Okay, so now let's look at another example. It's 10 p.m. In, in Vegas and I want a good Mediterranean restaurant. So what do I do here? You know, I start off with a simple, uh, basically the same thing as we did before. So I'm looking for uh, the open hour to be less than 10 p.m. and the close hour to be more than, uh, or, or greater than 10 p.m. Uh, but I'm also looking for uh, the categories field, which is an array to have uh, an entry uh, that's equal to Mediterranean. So I'm using this function called repeated contains, which lets me look into an array uh, on the fly as the query is, uh, is running with, with very, very high performance. And I see that you know, two examples of uh, restaurants that are open at, uh, at this hour are Olives and, uh, and this other one I can't, uh, can't pronounce, but uh, both Mediterranean restaurants open at uh, 10 p.m. I can do some more interesting things here by uh, you know, flattening data. So sometimes you have data in, say, a, a JSON type format that I want to do more complex analysis on or aggregations on. And it's hard to do when it's structured as JSON, right? But I have all these powerful operators in, in SQL that I'd love to be able to use. And so let's look at an example here. You know, first, we're you know, at the top of this, uh, this slide. What you see um, is a simple query. We're just uh, you know, printing out the first three records in this, uh, in this data set. So, uh, the first one is Eric Goldberg is a doctor and he has two categories. It's a doctor and health and medical. Those are the two categories. Second one's a restaurant and the third one has uh, two categories as well. I can use this flatten function that you see here at the bottom. So I select name and then flatten on the categories. And then I actually, the result of that is a, uh, it actually expands this so that uh, for every category, it's now creating another, uh, a separate record. So you can see that instead of having one record for Eric Goldberg, we now have two records for Eric Goldberg. We have one record for Eric Goldberg with the first category, which was doctors, and another record for Eric Goldberg uh, with health and medical, uh, the, that category, right? So we've now taken this kind of complex data and actually made it, you know, what would normally be a simple relational kind of structure, right? And, and this now allows us to go and do, for example, a group by on categories. So I'd like to understand in this data set, what are the most common categories? And that's something I couldn't do unless I actually did this kind of flattening. And when I say flattening, I don't mean doing that in a materialized way where I'm actually transforming the data into some flat structure. I'm actually doing this all on the fly uh, in a logical way, okay? So let's run a group by now, and I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna run this group by on uh, category, and I'm, as, as the source of that, as the table, I'm actually gonna use an inner query that's exactly what we just saw, that flatten, right? So remember the, the business name and, the cat and one category, business name and one category. So I'm doing a group by on that category, and, uh, and I can easily find out now that restaurants are the most common type of business in this, uh, in this data set, you know, shopping being the second most popular. And not surprising, you know, it's, it's, this data set is mostly from the desert. There aren't many boat dealers in that, uh, in that region. Uh, but the other surprising thing here is Australian. So why, what, what's this Australian business and, and why, you know, it's kind of interesting. Why is there only one Australian thing in, in, this, uh, in this entire state or, or a couple states? And so I can run a query. I can now explore, okay, what is this thing called Australian? I'm going, going to go back to what we saw earlier with the repeated contains function uh, on the categories array. And I'm going to look for all the records uh, that have a category called uh, Australian. And of course, only one comes back, which is uh, what you'd expect. But I now see that that business actually had additional categories, which are 
bars, burgers, nightlife, Australian sports bar, restaurants. So I now have a better sense of what that, what that kind of a, uh, anomaly was. This is uh, some Australian you know, bar, burger bar, or, or something like that. Um, I can also leverage views, and this is a very powerful concept um, in Drill, which lets different people kind of collaborate and define these, uh, these SQL queries, but then let other people query from their SQL queries. But a view is represented here as just as a, as a file in the underlying file system. It's just a simple JSON file that has the query for that view. Um, so we're gonna go back to that first data set we saw earlier, that's a CSV file. And this is a CSV file, um, doesn't have headers, and it just has all the names of the, the names in the US, I think it's, a, it's a specific to the US. And then for each name, it has the uh, probable gender. So the name is the first column, and in Drill, you can actually use um, uh, this magic, uh, magic field called columns. And so column zero is the first field, and columns four is going to be the fifth field. Um, so I could just run a query and do a select column zero and comma columns four, but that's, that's not very convenient, right? Um, so we're actually working on adding support for you know, CSV headers, but for now what I can do is I can, uh, I can create a view. And so the view will be select column zero as name and columns four as gender, and I'm gonna call that view just names, okay? So now when I run a query on names, I can just refer to, uh, you know, to those two field names, name and gender. So I have a simple view now, there's a name and there's a gender, and I can use that and combine that with other data sets to do more, more kind of interesting analysis on you know, what, do, what do different uh, genders do. So going back to our data set, let's start with what are the most common names and their genders on Yelp. So now I'm doing here, um, what I'm doing here is I'm doing a join across this CSV file in Hadoop with this MongoDB table called users. Okay, so I'm selecting the name, the gender, and doing a count. I'm grouping by the name and the gender. And what you'll see here is that, you know, David Mail uh, is the most common name and John Mail. Then Chris is uh, specified in that data set as unknown because, uh, you know, there's probably lots of male and female that are, uh, are called Chris. Um, Okay, now let's ask some more interesting questions because we all know that those were kind of the most common names in the, in the US. So um, who rates things higher, men or women? This was actually, I had no idea what the answer would be before I ran this, uh, ran this query. So what this query is doing is again, a join between these two different data sets. One is the user's collection in MongoDB and the other one is the names CSV file. And what we're asking here is, um, uh, sorry, what we're doing here is a group by on the gender. So we're just doing a count based on, or, or an average of the stars that these people rate their average star. And what we find is that the female, uh, female or women rate businesses higher than men. They're, they're uh, uh, more generous with their uh, reviews, right? So it's 3.77 for, uh, for women and 3.69 for men. And unknown is actually uh, kind of what you'd expect, right? Because it, it shows up in the middle in terms of what the average rating is, which you know probably some of those were women and some of those were men. So it actually kind of uh, makes sense uh, statistically. Um, then I had a question, okay, who writes longer reviews? Do men write longer reviews or do women write longer reviews? And again, this is something I could not address just by looking at you know, the Yelp data set in Hadoop or just by looking at the Mongo collections or just by looking at the names. I actually had to join three different tables here on the fly. And remember, this is very easy. We, we're not having to set up any metadata. So I didn't have to go and create anything in a Hive Meta store or some other metadata repository. All I have to do is just go query these data sets directly. All, all of this data is self-describing, right? The JSON has the field names, the Mongo collection has the field names in it, the CSV uh, has the, the columns and we created that view on it. And so I'm doing a three-way join here and I'm joining the review.json file. This is a, a, a very big file, so we have it in Hadoop. Um, then we have uh, the users uh, the user profiles, which are in MongoDB, that's kind of a typical uh, scenario. And then we have this simple names file, um, which is just on the distributed file system as well. That's that CSV file. And we're joining on the name as well as the user ID, and then doing a group by gender. And so we see that uh, generally women write longer reviews on average 730 characters versus 665 characters for, uh, for men. And you know, for people who we were not able to say if that's uh, a, a woman or a man, um, that actually shows up kind of nicely in the middle. So again, what you'd kind of expect. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of you guys for, uh, for coming here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Drill, what I'd recommend is just go to the website, download it onto your laptop, walk through one of the tutorials on that site. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or uh, uh, Jacques on, the, uh, on, our, on our emails here, or there's actually a mailing list, an Apache mailing list that you can just email any question to user at drill.apache.org. 
and there's a great community now with uh, participants you know, from, from many different companies, actually different continents all over the world that answer questions really quickly. So I think it's very easy to get started even if you run into an issue. Um, so with that, we'll open up to, uh, if there's any questions, happy to uh, take those. So, so both, both are possible. We actually provide a lot of different use, uh, capabilities there. So the, the most common pattern, frankly, in Hadoop is, is that a directory is more common than a file, right? You're going to maybe run a MapReduce job or something like that. You produce a large number of files, they all go into a directory. And so Drill absolutely allows you to query a directory. And actually, that's one of the more common things that people do because if you look at how the workspace concept works and you look at how directories work, you know, it starts to look exactly like a normal database because all I need to say is the name of the directory. I don't need any quoting or anything like that. So you can do that. You also have the capability to use globbing. So you can use a reg regular expression to also query certain files. So you may say, hey, I want to do kind of a specialized query where I only pick up files that have this pattern in the name or this pattern in one of the three directories that they sit within. So you can do that as well. And actually one of the things that we didn't actually hit on here is, is that we also take advantage of the file system for implicit partition pruning. Okay, and so if you query a directory that has many subdirectories, a common pattern might be you have a directory which is year, so you have like the 2014 directory and the 2015 directory, and then inside of that you might have months, so you have January and February in each of those directories. You can actually query at that root directory, and those show up as ad additional implicit fields inside the source. And so that means it actually shows up as dir0, shows up the value as 2014, and dir1 shows up as January, February, March. Okay, and so you can actually then leverage those and say, okay, I only want 2015 where it's January or February, and now we will automatically do partition pruning, avoid reading any of the data, but still interact with that like it's a relational. Another question? Does this also work on Cassandra? So we have, so the question was, does this work on Cassandra? And the answer is, is that there's someone, I would say that there's a pre-alpha plugin available today um, that uh, someone is working on for Cassandra. It isn't in the main line yet, but my expectation is, is that we'll quickly progress into a main line feature. So the question was, can we see some performance information? For example, if I'm joining between a Mongo table and an HDFS table, and I, I don't know what the third thing he said was, but uh, a couple different tables, what's the performance like, right? We want to have fast performance. And so the reality is, is that Drill does things very quickly. It relies on the underlying storage system in terms of what capabilities those have, right? And so, for example, if I'm querying a columnar parquet file, right, it's a very, very efficient format. I can read millions of rows per second per thread, right? That's going to be much faster than if I'm reading a MongoDB table because it just doesn't return that many records that quickly, right? And so the time is generally dominated in many cases by whatever the storage subsystem supports. Now that being said, for the things that we work with most closely, we actually work very hard to write native interfaces for those systems. So for example, Drill has its own columnar uh, sort of extended parquet reader that's native to how it works. And so they can read and write into the Drill's internal format as quickly as possible. The same thing's true of the ability to read JSON. So Drill has a custom JSON reader which is designed, built a little bit on top of Jackson, but really designed to have for maximum performance. The same thing is also true for text. And so as Drill grows, we will continue to implement native readers. And so right now, the Mongo reader is a, what I would describe as a semi-native reader. And so we're working closely with the Mongo community to try to make that a native reader as well to improve performance. But performance in most cases is generally limited by the performance of the underlying storage, or in some cases if you're not running on really fast network hardware, the speed that you can push stuff across the wire. Does that answer your question? Okay, and we're gonna, as I mentioned earlier, we're planning on putting up some benchmarks soon. It's just one of those things that you gotta force all the engineers to do it because it's not the most fun thing for engineers. So, okay. he's, gonna, he's gonna hijack. So, so the question was, uh, do we have the ability to delegate to the Mongo aggregation framework? to improve performance in some situations? And the answer is yes. So we already pushed down fil some simple filters and, uh, and, and uh, range pr pruning. So if you've got an ordered range inside of Mongo, we can actually prune that as well. Um, but our plan is absolutely to push down, and there's some people working on that right now, pushing down stuff into the aggregation framework. So let's start over here. 
is the view created for the CSV persisted? Yes, it is. It's persisted in the file system independent of drill. Okay, and so it's a JSON file. You can open it up, you can edit it, you can move it around, use it someplace else if you wanted to or delete it. And Drill will be happy in any of those situations. You can also create one of those files by hand if you want to or by some other tool and Drill will be just happy with that as well. Can Drill maybe take it on and share it off with the other drill bits? What's that? The Drill bit that you can just trade it on and then just share it with every other Drill bit? So the question was, if I create it on one Drill bit, how does it get shared with everybody else? And the answer is, is that generally speaking, the way you put, you put it on the distributed file system. So the view files in the distributed file system, not the local file system, so everybody has access to it. So a question back there? What's the failure model? What's the failure model? The failure model is an optimistic execution, and so data is being pushed down. It's very much an optimistic uh, pipeline approach. So if a node fails during a query, and that node is involved in that query, that query will fail. You got two guys next to each other. Yeah, so the question was, you talked a lot about MongoDB, how does it work with HBase? HBase kind of has a different format, right? And so for HBase, it's a little bit more interesting, right? So the first thing is with HBase is it's really a two-level map, right? You've got your column families and then you've got your column qualifiers, okay? So Drill actually exposes that level of, of relationship as a, the, the sort of logical data model. And then below that, inside of HBase, every column value is a byte, just bytes, right? And so by default, Drill returns that as a var binary. Right? That being said, provides, Drill provides a huge amount of capabilities. We didn't get into convert from and convert to, but you should read about those because those are designed, if you're familiar with traditional SQL, convert from and convert to were originally used for, in, for, for, for uh, text encodings, being able to convert from a byte, binary representation to an unknown text encoding. Right? Well, we've extended those to support all sorts of encodings. And so a common one might be if you have JSON embedded inside of one of those fields, you can use a convert from JSON, and that takes it into Drill's internal logical format so it can understand the complex data structures. We also have convert from, say, uh, what is it, writable, Hadoop int writable. Right? So if you've stored it that way. So we actually looked at Phoenix. We looked at um, sort of the HBase internal stuff as well as the Hadoop Ma MapReduce stuff and provide, about, I think, something like 30 different encodings of data formats that you might use inside of an, an HBase table to support that. What, one follow up there? So he's asking if we have Avro files, how does it work with Avro files? And so Drill actually has a native reader for Avro as well. So you can just point it at an Avro file or in a directory of Avro files and query it. On top of that, I, we, we actually didn't mention a lot here. I think I have one little teeny bullet on it is, is that we support Hive Metastore and Hive Certies as well. And so that also means that anything that Hive can read, we can read as well. So he's, he, the question was, what do you do with custom data object types, yeah. right? And we don't, I don't think we've figured that out yet. So hop on the list. I think it's pretty straightforward to come up with a mapping, right? But there isn't like a sort of a, a query way to do that today. So. And so I, I only heard half of that. It was. What's the, how's, how does very complex joins affect performance? What was the last bit? Yeah, okay. Of do we have? Yeah. So we have uh, what three different types of joins today. We have uh, a, a broadcast join, a hash join, and a uh, merge join. Okay. And what we do is we cost out the different options of how much it costs to shift data versus how much it costs to keep this in, in one location. Cost out what we think is the best option, and then and then take advantage of that. And we try to do that all. We try to do all the execution as optimistic as possible. So pushing streams downstream throughout the process. So more joins in many cases means more distribution. So we do do fully distributed joins, right? So if you've got a really large table on, on both sides of a join, like two fact table, uh, two fact table joins, right? In that case, we will typically do a hash redistribution of the data on the join keys, and then do that join. And so what in many cases happens is, is that you will get. The, the first thing that'll happen if you're doing really large joins on really large clusters is you'll get, bo you'll get bogged down in, in, in network bandwidth and that will slow down your join. But in general, we do very, very large joins and you know, seven, nine, 11 way joins uh, very effectively. Any? So
Okay, so, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer one question. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, you security. So, so repeat the question. Uh, yeah, the question was about security. How does, how does Drill handle security? So first of all, Drill, hand, you know, Drill handles like user identity and the user can authenticate, et cetera. Uh, but you can actually, leveraging this, this powerful kind of view concept, you can control who can see what, right? So you know, regardless of where the data is, you may have data in some, some system and you can then say that I'm only going to create a view, I'm gonna create a view that the data scientist can access. I'm not gonna give them access to the raw data. And in that view, I'm going to mask the credit card number or the social security number, uh, or I'm on only going to allow access to you know, public user profiles, but not people who have restricted access, right? So I can do all those things. As long as you can define the logic of what you want to enable access to with a SQL query, right, which is a very, very powerful concept, um, you can then delegate to different people and different people can delegate their access to other people Right, just by creating views on top of views that kind of restrict the access and leveraging the permissions in the, uh, the kind of the native permissions in the file system to control who gets to access that view and who doesn't. And on top of that, the other thing that, and so if you want to search for a keyword on AOL, no, I'm sorry, uh, on, the, on the Drill website, uh, you can search for ownership chaining because that'll link you into a bunch of this stuff because we have these sort of very powerful concepts about how you can delegate ownership of chains of views, which basically provides you the whole thing. And, and it's, as he said, it's really trying to use the native security implementations of the file system already rather than implementing a whole new layer. So I think that that's, at, we're out of time. If you want to come up and ask me questions afterwards or ask homework questions afterwards, please do. Thanks so much, guys.